Hi there, this is Wafa Al-Abedat. You are listening to the Women Power Podcast, a subsidiary platform to the Women Power Summit, the largest event in MENA, with the aim of empowering women and helping them achieve their absolute highest potential. Each week on the Women Power Podcast, you will hear honest, vulnerable, authentic, real conversations from inspiring women. These women will share their experiences and stories into what it takes to build a successful business and career. The podcast will share insight and inspiration and hopefully inspire action and lead change. Mashal Asai is a photographer and video artist based between Bahrain and New York. Through the process of representation and storytelling, she aims to blend the worlds of reality and fantasy, personal and generational, in order to conjure a dialectic representation in the Middle East region. Notable features and publications include Vogue Arabia and Vogue Italy, Al Jazeera Plus, Emirates Women, Mina Zine, Harper's Bazaar Arabia, Nasi Magazine, and Girl Gaze. Welcome, Mashal. Where are you currently based now? I think that question for this year is a very difficult one to answer. I'm based in Bahrain and Dubai right now. I'm currently recording this in Dubai. How come Dubai and Bahrain? So I actually used to live in Dubai before going to grad school or before starting grad school. And this is kind of the place where I started my photography career professionally. So for the COVID period, I spent it with my family. And then now, I mean, we're in November going back to work. It's made more sense to me to come back to Dubai to work here. And I kind of, when I say between Bahrain and Dubai, it's kind of just dependent on work and where my projects are and all of that. So you said that um, Dubai is where you started your photography career. Can you tell me more about how that happened? Yeah, you know, honestly, it's, I think for me, it was like 2016 when I first graduated, um, like undergrad. And I had come to Dubai like with like a background in urban design and I really wanted to work in architecture and urban planning. Um, And photography really wasn't on my radar. It was just something that I did for fun. I've always done for fun with my friends. Like, I'm always that, like, friend who has their camera on, like, days out and, like, is taking the photos and sending them around. But I never thought of it as, like, an art form for me personally, even though I had a lot of friends who were artists or photographers or into fashion and all of that. When I came to Dubai, I think I was really inspired by the community that I met here, and I started like taking photos of my friends first and then you know that kind of just like inspired me and wanted like I kind of wanted to keep doing it um and so for a period of time like in my early career I was a working like full-time job and then doing my photography on weekends or whenever I had a chance what was your full-time job or your first job actually I was working at an engineering consulting firm when I first graduated and I was an intern and I like remember one of my early projects was like traffic control. <laughs> so it's like a di- very different world. I think it's very interesting. I don't see like that education that I have or I had as a complete like divorce from what I'm doing now. I've always been interested in like spatial studies and the way people interact in space. And a lot of that is like dependent on what the built form looks like. And when I think about like the visual world, space building, it kind of works in a similar in a similar way where I, I'm literally world building. But ex- instead of it being real life experience, it's also just like the visual experience. So, yeah, I think I think there is a connection with like architecture and world building and, and you know, how you communicate that visually, even if it is photography or if it's, for example, video, which we can talk about later, like. That's another space where you're really creating everything from the light to the size of the like the scale of the photograph. Like these are these are attributes that you get to play with and you get to manipulate and that communicates your narrative. You studied urban design at Berkeley. What was your student life like and why did you pick urban design? So I was a very confused student (laughs) when I went to college I think like I first went into uni thinking I wanted to do art practice actual just visual arts and I kind of approached my experience at Berkeley very idealistically and education I was very open I think to 
just like experimenting and learning different things. So I like fell into so many different majors over four years. It was art. And then for a while I wanted to do sociology. And then I ended up like doing a year of architecture. And then from architecture, that's kind of where I was like, oh, I, I love the built form, but I don't care much for design. I care more about like what's the outcome of it and like what does it mean for the community. So that's kind of why I like jumped into urban design. And yeah, it looked like it took the long way around, but in the end, I think it, it made more sense, like looking back, like why I was interested in all these different fields. Were your parents frustrated with you? Like pick something already to focus on yeah, or were they course. supportive? Of course. I remember my mom really wanted me to do architecture. And my, I mean, my parents are very supportive, alhamdulillah, like in terms of supporting my art career and supporting um, the decisions that I made. But yeah, definitely, like it would have been more convenient <laughs> to do like a traditional route and yeah, it was always a funny conversation. And I was like, oh, I changed again. <laughs> I'm interested in something new. <laughs> I went to Chelsea College of Art and Design in London. And, you know, your foundation year, you get to do all these different things. You get to do art and film and media. And then you're meant to pick a specialization for your first year. But how the British system works, unfortunately, it doesn't give you the opportunity to change. And my parents are like, we're only going to fund your art education if you're going to do interior design. Like that makes like you're not going to be like a starving artist. You're not going to be like a khayat, like with your t you're not going to be a tailor. You can't study fashion. It has to be interior design because that's where they foresaw their ROI, right? Their return of investment, like you're going to yeah. be OK in the future. I remember the first day of my interior design class and I was like, whoa, this is not for me. It was just like the. Um, it was the what was it the, the boards with the like the scale and the rulers and just the pencil thicknesses and I'm just like this is not for me like I'm not this detailed and I remember I called my mom and I was I don't want to do this like I'm not happy this is not for me and she's like oh you don't want to do this come back to Bahrain we're not gonna pay for you to redo yeah. your whole year so I'm like you know what I'm good like I'm good I'm just gonna power through I'm just going. And I actually graduated, like, I still think it's my biggest achievement, graduating from a degree that I hated, but making the most out of being in design school, just like immersing myself in art and design in London, but also like through other students and through other programs. So it's so hard to figure out what you want to do when you're just 18 or 19. Like, how, how do we know? You know what I mean? It's an incredible amount of pressure, I think, especially for a fresh graduate and going into a British system, which is more regimented, to be like, yes, like, I don't know, law for the next, I don't know, 50 years of my life. Yeah, I think, you know, you're, you never stop really learning. And it's, it's nice that I think that perhaps people are more agile right now with what they're doing. And, and like, you can be, you know, working, studying interior design and like, I don't know. Um, working in fintech it, it doesn't I think it's more about like um, your own passion your own drive and like what's your what you're interested in and, like the degree truly does not matter you said that you worked or you had a full-time job but then in your spare time you were pursuing photography when was the moment you decided you know what I'm gonna quit my job and I'm gonna focus on this full-time what happened for you to be able to take that leap you know, I think it was at the end of my second job in Dubai where I was working in photography, but also um, I started to like dip into directing and I never studied photography. I never ended up studying like a film or I mean, I went into college hoping that I would do art, but I never really got around to like actually spending time practicing like or learning art. So I made the decision that I wanted to do grad school and that I wanted to like actually like I have this passion that I have for creating visual images and like I want to explore that. I think explore that. I want to explore that. <laughs> and I just, you know, I made the decision that I wanted to do grad school. And so that's when I was like, OK, you know what? I'm going to do grad school at the end of this year. I'm going to hand in my resignation three months early and I'm going to focus on that and um that's what I did that's that's the switch that happened it was when I was like okay I I have this interest I want to explore it more I might fail I might fall on my butt but it's okay like I think that if this is something that I'm interested in doing like on weekends and all of my spare time like I should actually 
give myself that time and that space to explore it further. So where did you go for your grad school? So I started at NYU and my concentration at Gallatin is film photography and um, new media. But um, because of COVID, <laughs> I've only completed one out of two years of the program. So technically, I'm in like the middle, like, I don't know, stage. I That's why I'm coming back to Dubai and come back to the Middle East in general, like to Bahrain, because it doesn't really make sense. I think right now it's very difficult. I really like my heart goes out to all the the kids who are like doing Zoom classes right now because I, I purely, I just can't do it. I think it's, um I learn more being on the ground and like being in a cast, classroom with people and having those conversations in person rather than um, like on Zoom. And I think that's just my personal preference. So you're taking like almost like a gap year, I guess. So yeah. yeah, a gap year to kind of just go back to what I was doing before I went to school. <laughs> so wow, you're still technically a student. Yes, technically I am. <laughs> I still have the email and everything. I love going to school. I love learning. Like you said, I don't think we ever stop learning. Yeah, I think, you know, what's actually interesting about this period of time is that people have gotten really creative with like online classes. Um, like my sister just started an interior course online and like a friend of mine is learning Spanish on Duolingo. Like it's just like, it's great to see that people are like, leveraging their like either their network or like what's available online just like even you know just listening in on like youtube conversations or just like um yeah. I, i have a friend who is learning french and her husband's also learning french and he's doing cooking through master class and she's also doing like a happiness program through like a harvard like a free course on coursera or something so i know what you mean now like it just feels like everybody's trying to like learn all the skills or learn or pursue you know their curious passions in this time where a lot of the social aspect of our lives has been edited out so now we have free time right we don't have weddings to go to and engagements and all these receptions and bridals and all of a sudden it's like whoa all this time what do i do <laughs> so you fill it in with learning yeah exactly uh, and there's like a democratization i think of intellectual property or let's say just like courses like access having greater access through like online channels we're stuck at home and we're trying to get creative yani i think it, there's also i mean on the other side i i'm very much part of the camp of like if you feel like during this period you truly did not want to create or you just really wanted to take more reflective time like that whatever everyone needed in order to get through 2020 <laughs> is entirely valid how do you start to get your work out there like how do you go from you know i'm doing this for fun i'm taking photos of my friends and things that i'm interested in to actually getting your work seen publicly i mean i still struggle with calling myself an artist um and i think Yeah, it's, I think it's a little difficult to enter into the art world just because it depends on, like, you need a, you kind of need a shot, right? Someone needs to, like, give you a shot, but also you need to, like, be persistent and, you know, like we had the conversation earlier, just, like, be a part of the conversation um, and connect with people and, you know, keep focusing on work that means means something to you. And I think that's, For me, that's what happened is when I started making work that was very vulnerable and was very um, true to my experience um, and true to myself, I found that people responded um, in a way that they didn't necessarily respond to the previous work. And this is when I started exploring themes of like the female Arab experience, themes of lineage, themes of family and performance. And so I think, I mean, Alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to like have been connected with people who saw the work and then, you know, uh, responded to it and then wanted to include me in part of the conversation. I think there's also like a great opportunity online. I mean, a lot of my stuff is online as like has gotten responses via like social media or websites or online galleries and whatnot. And so I think there's no really prescriptive track when it comes to the art world. And I think it's just you as an artist really need to just focus on the work itself 
and the the message that you're trying to portray and send out and from that i think when you're when you're confident in that and when you're um when you're really putting yourself into your work it kind of, it shows i think that it's that's been true for me do you find that you are responding to these or submissions or do you find that people are you know uh, organizations or curators are contacting you directly to be like hey we want to include you in this space you know which one is it are you kind of putting yourself out there or are you being chosen or selected no i'm definitely like putting myself out there in terms of like it's always going to be a hustle especially when it comes to visual imagery just cuz you know there's a lot of visual imagery that you consume and i think that uh, it's always great to put yourself out there like even if you're not going to get a response that's positive like if even if you know there's like i don't know a really difficult chance for you to get into something whatever i think you know the ability to be like you know what i'm just doing this i'm um i'm reaching out i'm putting myself in this uncomfortable like vulnerable position um and sharing my thoughts on paper that's another thing like i feel like i um i struggle while i like i i can communicate via visual i struggle with the written word and i think that's very uncomfortable for me when i do these open calls is that i have to explain and it comes from very emotional or vulnerable space and so it's a little difficult to put my work out there and so it it sometimes feel like feels like it's when a rejection comes back it feels like it's uh, personal but it really isn't i'm like trying to separate myself from the work are you currently making a living out of being a freelancer or a photographer like it, are you finding a way to monetize on this or are you just you know you're embracing st- you know being a student being in the moment experimenting and just enjoying the process It's always difficult to make a living out of a arts field. I think you need to be agile and resourceful and, you know, um to make it as a freelancer like you don't really stop working because <laughs> you're working weekends every opportunity that comes your way you kind of just have to run with it. And I think that it it's definitely a difficult day to day. Um I love it because I'm never not like i'm never idle like i'm always somehow working whether it's like on my photography or film making or anything else that i can get my hands on so i enjoy that hustle but it's definitely difficult it definitely comes with its disappointments but yeah um so i did the again i did the corporate life and i like enjoy the stability and the routine but i think that when you have an itch to make something or if you have an itch to tell a story um you can't ignore it like as hard as it is you can ignore it we're very proud to announce our collaboration with a brand that we strongly resonate with and are huge fans of the woman power podcast will be sponsored by neo books and coffee for our upcoming season 4 neo books and coffee is an independent bookshop and coffee bar housing a wide collection of both english and arabic books stationery and gifts their coffee bar serves and sells quality teas from tea pigs and only the finest arabica beans They also have a coffee app available on both iOS and Android devices. The Woman Power Podcast is delighted to be working with our new partners and look forward to producing more meaningful content and recognizing our goals together. Watch the space for more exciting details. I find that some freelancers feel they have to sometimes compromise or create work that's maybe commercial or they go where the demand is to make a living and then they that continue to fund or fuels the things that they love do you find yourself in that position at all i think it's i mean that's a really tough question and i definitely see this happening all the time i think it's a matter of like you need to understand what makes what exactly is the situation so let's say a brand approaches me and is like oh we want to make this film whatever i think there's a there's a specific niche aesthetic or a niche storyline that i have like cultivated or like i'm trying to explore and so there's a reason for that joint interest and i have taken commercial works which are whether they're fashion related or product related it's i feel a connection to the person that i'm collaborating with and even from a commercial intention there can be i mean there's room for exploring those artistic goals that i have. So yeah, i think 
I think it is possible to marry commercial with artistic. It's just a matter of like, how can you make this so that it makes sense for you as an artist and makes sense for um, your collaborator? You keep coming back to certain themes. I think you mentioned them, lineage, family, the female body. And why do you find yourself coming back to these kind of storylines over and over again? Yeah, I think honestly, it's just because my work is about understanding myself it's kind of like yeah it's exploring my selfhood like why do I think the way I do and like what experiences have led to where I am right now and what do they mean um I don't take things for granted in terms of like the way our environment is or the way I approach things and I really try to lean into the things that make me uncomfortable about you know my position in my world like as an Arab woman and then also as an Arab woman who like can you know can exist in a western like I've I studied in, in the states and so like I feel like I came in being able to kind of float between cultures and like what does that mean for me I I and then also like what does it mean to be an Arab woman making air making photographs or making films about other Arab women. So there's a lot of weight, I think. There's, I, I think there's not one question. I, one of the themes that, or the words that always gets thrown out is representation, but it's not just representation. I think you populate media with people who look like you. That's one step as well. But then like we're, we're trying to flip the narrative here. We're trying to create as much as we consume. And what we create has a huge cultural importance. Again, we have democratized the creative space in the sense of like you can go online now and post, you can curate how you want to be perceived. And so that's an exciting exercise. Yeah, I think it's just the work I, that I do, I, I think is just really leaning into the things that make me uncomfortable. And things that make me uncomfortable are things that I've taken for granted as like, the all and be all of you know of our culture yeah I never thought my social media page would be a form of self-expression of who I am but it absolutely is now that I think about it like everything I choose to put on there is is me trying to tell a different story about who I am or trying to put out a message about you know how I'm feeling but I always thought it was like just social media and you post but actually they're all like self expressions of who we are um i wanted to know more about you know how you curate your own social media there's such beautiful work on there how do you you know that almost feels so curated how do you pick your subjects and how do you figure out where to shoot them and some of the work is i don't want to say it's similar but you do have your own style so you can kind of tell especially when you look at the the photos of possibly your friends or your colleagues or um, some of the Arab women that you take photos of, there is something there that is like a common thread. They're very independent women. They're very beautiful. It's shot in a really raw way. How do you put your content together on social and what does it say about you? I'll talk a little bit. I mean, I think the question, I'll, I'll like break it up into two parts because I have, you're kind of catching me at a space right now where I'm very turned off by the social sphere um and that's just you know you know, just taking a step back from like your virtual world and then being more engaging like being more engaged in my offline world so that's kind of one side but I think in terms of how I create my images I mean it's really great to also just tap into my community and like have this portrait taking session with someone that either I'm close to or I become close to at the end of the shooting session I shoot on film so it's quite slow I can have time to like sit with the person that I'm taking the portrait of and like you know talk to them get them comfortable it's film so we don't really have a reference of like how the photos are looking but there's like a trust established there that like I see you and I see how you want to be depicted and I, we are sharing this experience right now and I think like some of my favorite images I've taken just try to attempt to capture that energy that's been exchanged during the portrait taking session. And then there are other projects where it's, um, I, I've come in with a little bit more of a direction in the sense of like, I have a specific narrative that I, I'm trying to convey. And I usually like 
reach out for pe- to people and like explain what the story is and like have them really want to be on board with the messaging and with what this means for me and how it can also mean something for them. What is your operational style like? <laughs> That's really, I mean, as a freelancer, I think it's really difficult to like, there's a trial and error period. I am quite regimented in a sense of like, I'm a morning person and I like to get all my stuff done before the sun goes down. And then also that's just like shooting wise, I love shooting in daylight. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is definitely something that this year has taught me is how to make a routine no matter where you are and just reliance on yourself so you can be agile and like you can be productive even when you feel like you're in a slump. And I think it's just being realistic with what you can achieve every day because you never want to load up your to-do list with things that are like so unachievable that you feel under like you don't feel productive and you feel bad about yourself. So that's definitely something that I like to keep in mind. And the way I organize my day essentially is shooting usually happens on the later part of the week, editing usually in the beginning days of the week, meetings on one day of the week. So it kind of just like organizes my schedule for me. And then I can, I can feel like I have a routine because it's very important for me personally to have that like, okay, from this time to this time, I'm doing this and like, breaking down a huge project into smaller chunks so that it's not so overwhelming as well. What is the ceiling of what you're able to achieve other than like doing what you love and creating work? I think I don't see it as a goal just because approach that I have to making work is deeply introspective. And so following that line of thinking, like what would be the ultimate introspection? I don't think truly exists. I do want to continue doing research. I really enjoy it. And I think that. um, For me, I just love having those conversations with people about the work in addition to having the work be done. And so I guess, I mean, an ultimate goal in terms of like the traditional sense is like I would love to be able to share work and have people receive it and have conversations about it and, you know, eventually get to, I don't know, teach it, um, give back in that sense, because I mean, we spoke about this earlier in the podcast is that education has been such a vital part of my whole experience. And I think I do see myself in the long term kind of going back into that while also still creating. We at Tobin Hill have over a decade's worth of experience working with some of the world's most successful brands across F&B, retail, culture and hospitality. We are equally at home helping a brand define its point of view positioning a new development, designing product, packaging, or creating content that speaks to an audience. Whatever the challenge, we deliver sharp, intelligent content-driven work that helps brands amplify their message to customers around the world. Contact us on www.obionhill.com or DMing us on Instagram for your public relations, social media, and branding needs. What has been your best shooting experience so far and what subject was it with and what has been the worst? I think one of the projects that I really loved was Dehin, which is a video installation. And I loved that because it featured my grandmother's voice. And for selfish reasons, that's one of my favorites because I love her. And her voice is so, like, it's very powerful. And just recording that was a very... And like making that video itself was a very um, emotional process. I would say that that was one of my favorites. But then other moments as well, I think there's there's times when I've taken like portraits of people and it's film and where there's like music in the background and the light is heard hitting perfectly. And I can see through my lens that this is the shot. And it feels like euphoria. Like it's such a beautiful feeling. And then I get my negatives back and I'm like, I knew it. It was in my gut. That was the shot. Yeah. I have a very romantic kind of like view of film. Okay. So that was your best shooting experience. Tell me about your worst. Like what a disaster. Never again. It was hot. You know, (laughs) we melted or, you know, terrible location. What happened? But I don't have anything on the top of my head. I mean, I've definitely had 
like projects that are just like arduous just because they took so long or like you said like the logistics is just very difficult I really enjoy having intimate like calm slow moments and so if I'm on like a time crunch because the sun is going down or we're on location and you know the model or the person that I'm shooting is is getting like hot and we're all like antsy like that just makes it uncomfortable and these things translate so I think the more I shoot I kind of optimize to avoid those issues (laughs) Can you talk me a bit more about filmmaking? So I know that you, we talked a lot about photography, but, and, and you talked about your favorite moment was shooting that piece of film with um, your grandmother. But how did you, do you, does the world of photography and film kind of connect with each other or are they separated? How did you make the move from, again, shooting your friends, shooting for fun, and then all of a sudden now you're playing around with film? It really started because I began art directing or just you know same as what I would do with photography but now translated to the to video and that just became a lot of fun I think at that point I just I wanted to play and I am still in that period like that mindset of like I'm trying to experiment with the medium because what's most important above all is why the why like why am I doing this like what does this mean like what is the messaging um, what's the narration like what is this about and it can be a photograph it could be a film it could be I don't know a sculpture I I don't know I haven't experimented with sculpture but I do feel like I'm more open to the mediums now and it didn't feel like a big jump obviously with photography to video and then even now as I'm experimenting with performance it doesn't feel like necessarily a big jump but that's because the unifying theme is is very true to me so yeah I think it's just different modes of thinking I mean in terms of like the making process but the the thought process is pretty much the same who do you look up to in the in the photography and film space who are you like wow I would you know you know it's somebody that you kind of collect their work or have like coffee books about them or would want to hear them speak or is there like You know, who are your ideal mentors, even if you haven't met them? I love to learn about Arab and regional artists. There's like a conversation that I love to have with the work that they do. So, I mean, I love Muna (laughs) Hatoum. I also love Shireen Nishat's work. I think I love to learn as well about my people in my community and what they're up to, because it's a collaborative kind of experience that we're having together. So whether it's friends who are like in jewelry design and they're trying to figure out like what it means to use different shapes or if it's a fashion designer and she's interested in the process of how how she's making her pieces. Inspiration, I think it's really like it just depends on like the context and what you're exposed to. But I think it's really empowering when you when you look at your own community for um the inspiration rather than you know always looking for the western ideal which not necessarily is is feeding the conversation it's not feeding the conversation like we need to have conversation with people who are arab women who are making things like the, this is the environment right now like that's that's a more interesting conversation for me to participate in do you have any parting words for potential freelancers who really want to make this their career i think reach out to people who you could consider mentors is probably the best advice anyone has given me personally um, is to like seek out mentors and like to find people who can be your sounding board for things that you're not so sure of or things that you want to explore. The mentors that I have in my life have really pushed me and challenged me and that comes from a genuine place of like I want you to succeed and I want you to to make something more and so yeah I think that's that was really important for me. So have you reached out to people, like people you don't even know, just like DM them? Or have you asked people to connect to you? How have you reached out to them? Yeah, any number of ways. There's just people that I've kind of seen around and seen their work. And then I just, you know, reached out on Instagram and been like, hey, like, let's have coffee. Like, would love to talk to you about this, this, this. Or it's been like through my community, my educational community. And it's just really sitting someone down and just being like, I admire your work. 
and I want to learn from you in in like a without ego like without just you know just genuinely two artists wanting to have a conversation I've also just been lucky to have friends who act like mentors as well like May Martez Spahini artist and I've I've I love having our conversations because I think that she sees me so deeply as an artist and as a friend that we've always had really great conversations with each other on our works. So I think it's important to have a safe space to have these discussions. I really appreciate how present you are. I think in a world where everything is so fast and everybody is, you know, their attention spans are really short. I feel like you really embrace the art of being present with your work, with yourself, because I feel like you can easily get distracted and get lost in the stuff that doesn't, not necessarily doesn't matter, but doesn't add value to yourself or your work. And I feel like you're really focused on living, creating and being, which is really like my biggest takeaway from this uh, interview. So thank you. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Women Power Podcast. And thank you for downloading and streaming our podcast every week. If you love what you've heard, tag us on Instagram and follow the Women Power Podcast and the Women Power Summit account for more information on our next episode. Please leave a rating review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps other women discover the show. That's it from me. See you next week.